titled um, Storage Replication in High Performance, High Availability Environments. And before I start with getting into the talk proper, I'd like to get a little bit of a feel from you guys who's been working with what kind of stuff that I'd, I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, 20 minutes. So um, those who are here, um, I presume most of you, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, have already uh, dealt with or worked with HA solutions on the Linux platform, right? Can I have hands for that? Who, who asks? Okay, plenty, great. Um, of those, who of you guys is familiar with the Pacemaker-based Linux cluster stack? Quite a few, great, okay. Um, who of you are familiar with storage replication technologies of whatever kind? Could be DRBD, but doesn't have to. Stuff like SRDF or Metro Mirror or whatever they call continuous access. Okay, quite a few. Okay, and who of you um, have worked with or are familiar with um, hardware RAID solid state caching technology? This goes by a variety of, of brand names such as uh, LSI CacheCade or Adaptech Max Cache. Have, have any of you worked uh, on, with that in, in storage arrays? Okay, a few. Great. Um, who of you has, prior to this talk, heard of this thing called flash cache? Okay. Um, any of you here currently running flash cache on one of the servers or systems that you manage? One. Great. <laughs> Okay, so besides those two, who of you uses flash cache at this point? None? Right, um, or so you think. Uh, who of you currently has a tab open in a browser window that is displaying this conspicuous logo somewhere? Some obscure website, some of you may have heard about it. There's only about 800 million people that are on it, allegedly. Um, so this is where Flash Cache originally comes out of. Um, Flash Cache is originally a development at uh, Facebook. The uh, primary developers at Facebook are, I hope I'm not butchering his name too badly, Mohan Srinivasan and uh, Paul Saab. And uh, there's a significant, some significant input that's gone into the project uh, also from uh, Vadim Kachenko from uh, Procona. So those are the, 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 the primary drivers there. Uh, Facebook is, and I guess this is not surprising, they're a bit reluctant to disclose what they actually use it for, but what's publicly known is that at least originally they developed it for um, MySQL InnoDB data storage. Um, MySQL with the InnoDB backend or, or storage engine at the time had this issue of when you shut a MySQL instance down um, and brought it back up, if the database was you know, reasonably large, then for a, quite a significant amount of time immediately after the, the, the boot up, because the thing would be operating out of cold caches, it would be significantly slower than when it's running with warm caches, in other words, when the, when the server had been running for a while. And of course, that's not a good thing for a setup for Facebook, which has tons and tons and tons of data, which has to be served really, really, really quickly, and where nodes occasionally just go down. It just happens. Um, so that's what it, what it originally comes from, but um, it's not in any way InnoDB or MySQL specific. It's just a generic block level um, caching storage for the Linux platform. I'm going to get to um, how that's implemented in a little more detail in just a little bit. Okay, so what's this good for? Um, suppose we've got uh, tons of data that we need to serve and we need to serve it fast. Facebook is an, a sort of an extreme example of that. But there's a bunch of applications for which that is the case. You just have hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data in your general data storage, but you need to also serve that reasonably quickly. Now, one way to do that is you can just, just basically toss money at the problem until it goes away. Um, money in this case being hardware. So what you can do is you can just take that amount of storage that was previously in relatively cheap, at least in a you know, dollars per terabyte um, uh, view uh, storage arrays, and you just toss all of that into SSDs. 
This is something that you could call, you know, perhaps the one percenter approach. It's not, there's not too many companies that can actually afford that. For most people, this sort of approach where you're just strictly throwing hardware at the problem is hardly cost effective. So what if we can, we could go ahead and combine a relatively fast but smaller and arguably expensive SSD, combine that with a uh, humongous but slower and cheaper storage box. And that is exactly what Flash Cache does for us. Um, LSI uh, Cache Kate or Adaptec Max Cache do the same thing, but they do that in controller firmware, and that is in a you know, reasonably closed and proprietary fashion. And in Flash Cache, we can do that um, in a much more open way and a much more generic way and in software and in Linux. So uh, really what Flash Cache is, it's, it's relatively simply a device mapper target. Um, device mapper is something that pretty much all of you are going to be familiar with, um, you know, if not for anything else, then for LVM. Um, the device mapper infrastructure is, of course, the underlying uh, layer in the, uh, in the kernel that makes something like LVM possible. And of course, it's a, uh, it's a pluggable architecture where you can just add new modules and then those can provide additional types of device maps that are then exposed to the rest of the system as simple block devices. So it's that. It's a simple device mapper module. Um, called DM Flash Cache, and it comes with a handful of useland um, utilities. Currently, four, a fifth one is just uh, is just currently being merged. Um, so you get an, a, a number of utilities uh, that just install into user Espin, and uh, you use uh, one utility is called Flash Cache Create. Uh, you initialize basically the backing device and its cache devices. It has a boatload of options where you can fine tune the the cache as well. And then you have another thing that's flash cache load, which simply activates this device and puts it into um, a device map. And then the device pops up under def mapper and then the, the, the device name as you would expect uh, from any device mapper module. And after that, we can simply use this thing as we would any other block device. So uh, the canonical way of doing this would obviously be uh, to just slap a file system on top of it, but this being a block device, you can use it for anything else that you could use any other block device for, including, by the way, um, something like a, an LVM uh, physical volume. So um, how does the data flow through this kind of device now actually work? Consider for a moment uh, that we're reading, say, I don't know, let's say uh, we're reading one gigabyte of data at um, offset you know, 42, from a specific uh, from this from this device, and what this thing will do for us is, assuming we've just brought this thing up, it's not going to be in the cache. It's just going to be on the local disk array. It's going to go there and going to get that uh, one gigabyte that we're about to read from offset 42. Serve that up to the application, but at the same time also write a copy of that into this solid state cache, and then the next time. We need to hit the disk, which means we're not only uh, reading that same uh, area of data, but it's also either no longer in our RAM page cache or it's been invalidated in the page cache. Um, next time we need to actually hit the disk to read this, we don't have to hit the slow storage array. Instead, we can serve that pretty much immediately from the, uh, from the caching device. And that's a really, really nice uh, trade-off that we're getting there. We don't have to, we don't have to uh, toss money at the problem quite as badly. We don't have to spend as many bucks for it uh, because we don't have to replace the whole thing with SSD. We're just putting stuff on SSD that it's the, that's sort of the most important. This thing just employs a regular LRU, at least recently used cache. So stuff that hasn't been used for a while just gets evicted from the cache and uh, the newer data uh, gets put into it. And um, if, even if you, even if you uh, got something like half a terabyte of flash RAM here, um, that's still a pretty good uh, performance improvement and your data set that's actually being used and updated regularly, or even being read regularly, um, is quite likely to actually not exceed that. 
in many, many applications. Now, when we want to use this in a high availability environment, there's two options for doing this. And, and by the way, I'm only going into the, the, um, the DRBD side of things here, uh, because obviously if, we, if you want to do this with more proprietary applications that you can, or a more proprietary approach that you can do that as well. So you would be using something like Cascade in the controller and then some super expensive uh, replication facility between two storage subsystems. But the canonical way of doing this in Linux is simply with uh, DRBD. Uh, so the simple approach here is you take one DRBD device and you simply stack that on top of two flash cache devices, one on the one node and one on the other. And the way that DRBD works, we just get synchronous replication between these two. Anything that we're writing uh, goes into the flash cache device. Anything that we're reading comes from the flash cache device. And uh, that way we can significantly speed up the process. But there's really nothing new to this. It's just because you can use any backing device, any, any block device as a DRBD backing device, this thing is essentially a no-brainer. It's really, really simple. It has a downside, though. And that is, consider what I said earlier. You have an application, and this is, by, by the way, by no means uh, InnoDB specific, or MySQL specific for that matter. Uh, your application, when it's running off of cold caches, it's going to be slower than when it's running off of hot caches. So when you fail over, remember, you've got um, a DBD replication uh, between these two nodes. You fail over to your other node. All of your data is going to be there. Uh, DBD is going to make sure that that is the case. But because DBD has no updates to do on reading, now when you fail over, the cache is cold on the other side. So after that failover, you can be expected to take a performance hit, uh, which is, of course, a lot better than being down. But in many applications, that's unacceptable. You want to be up to your full performance and not take a performance hit immediately after failover even. Uh, but other than that, this just works. But we have another option where we can uh, circumvent this, this downside that I, that I just mentioned. Uh, namely the thing with the cold caches. And that is to basically turn this whole thing upside down. So rather than putting DRBD onto flash cache devices, what we can do instead is we can put flash cache on top of two DRBD devices. So what do I mean by that? We would have one DRBD device, which is just you know, your regular LUN on, uh, on, on, your, on your big storage space. And you would have another one that um, mirrors two really, really fast SSDs between uh, two hosts. And now, and this is a feature that was added to DRBD in the 8.4 release. Uh, in DRBD 8.4, we can do multiple volumes in one DRBD resource. That is to say, we have two separate DRBD devices. They both have their own sets of backing devices. But because they're in the same resource, they share one replication stream. And that in turn means that not only are we synchronously replicating over to another node, we're also preserving write fidelity, write after write fidelity, across all of these volumes in a replication group. In other words, we make sure that not only is one of these resources uh, or one of these devices consistent between both nodes, but in fact, both are. And that's really nice because now what we have is um, we get all the benefits that we normally get from flash cache, which we also get in the earlier approach of just uh, putting DRBD on top of flash cache. But now we're getting a preheated cache on failover, which is really nice. So now we have uh, the same uh, quick access to the data that we need most or that we need most often, even immediately after failover, which is really, really cool. What it does require is that we need to integrate our flash cache management into the pacemaker uh, cluster. But what's nice is that that's already done. So um, here is, so how does this, uh, and I'm gonna get to in just a second how we configure this. So how does this really help us? Um, it's very simple. It's, uh, we, can, uh, we can wire up a, a, simple, a simple test case where we can read just a, a streaming read with a simple DD with 
Odirect enabled, where we're hitting the flash cache device, uh, the first read that we're making is going to be constrained by however quick the underlying rotating storage array is, because remember, at that time, cache is cold, we simply have to um, hit the disk, and then well, you know, presumably we're, our disks are going to be pulling something like, I don't know, 50, 60 megabytes per second. Um, and uh, and uh, when, we, when we stripe that, you know, over two stripes, we can maybe double that. So, for example, we would be reading with something like 110 megabytes per second. On the second read of that same data, however, we can now hit the cache, and then we're going to be as fast as the SSD is. And uh, in, in, in my test, that was with a reasonably low-end SSD device. Um, I was reading with 270, 278 megabytes per second. Um, but if you get a, a decent you know, enterprise SSD, that's going to be considerably uh, faster. And then you fail over, and then you do the same read again. And then immediately after that failover, you immediately get that preheated cache. And on your first read, you're reading with those 270, 280 megabytes per second because it's now uh, hitting the preheated cache, which is really nice. And by the way, uh, flash cache um, has several modes of operation. So one is a, uh, a, a write back mode, which I've been referring to up to this point, which usually means that your, uh, your cache device is an SSD, something that's reasonably fast on, on reads and writes and persistent. But you can also use flash cache in a write through mode where we're not using any sort of caching on writes at all. Um, but we can still use it on reads. Um, and then you could be using something like a non-volatile RAM violin device if you wanted to, um, or a RAM disk for that matter. Uh, like I said, it's quite flexible. It doesn't have to be an, an SSD, although, of course, in most cases, it's going to be an SSD that we're using as our caching device. Now, for the pacemaker integration, um, the uh, an OCF resource agent for this is done. Um, it's been submitted upstream to the uh, Flash Cache project. It's still sitting in a pull request there. Um, and um, there's a current discussion that is ongoing about it. There's uh, some uh, testers that came in just a couple of weeks ago. So we'll see how that, uh, how that holds up. But the, uh, the OCF resource agent is already there. What it does is very, very simple. It just uh, creates this device, or it loads the device with flash cache load. It has to be manually created by the administrator beforehand, but only once. And then any time we fire this up or we fail over, this resource agent automatically just does a flash cache load. When it shuts down, it does a DM setup remove, so it gets kicked out of the, of the device mapper uh, setup table. It's just another primitive in a, uh, in a CRM uh, shell group configuration, and it's commonly ordered before and co-located with the file system that we uh, put our data into. So this is an example um, configuration here. That's pretty much all it takes. Uh, we have a, a DOBD device. Um, this, of course, would be a DUB device with um, two volumes. It's still managed the same way in Pacemaker. It's just a single resource, in this case named Flash Cache. We've got this clone that we use for, uh, for, the, for the Pacemaker management. And then we simply have this primitive here, OCF Flash Cache Flash Cache. We assign a name. Uh, we give it a, 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 a cache device and a backing device, and that's it. In this case, your dev DUBD0 would be that DUBD volume that's on um, you know, just a rotating disk storage array, such as like a RAID, and your cache device would be the DUBD that's replicating between two SSDs. So if you're not familiar with pacemaker configuration syntax at all, this is not going to tell you much. However, if you are, then you'll quickly realize it's really, really simple. The way uh, we configure this flash cache thing is just as we would any highly available file system or block device or otherwise. OK, so um, does that mean that everything is fine and dandy and wonderful? Uh, I wish I could say that, but it's not quite that way. Um, and you can help. So uh, there is a few things that could still use some work and a few things that you want to be aware of. So one thing, if you dislike having out-of-tree kernel modules on your system, steer clear of this. Uh, flash cache is completely out of tree. I don't think there's any effort at all to actually mainline this, uh, which comes with all of its usual consequences, such as if 
no one has made an effort to actually, you know, forward port or back port some flash cache, um, you know, uh, call signatures of, of functions, how it's using, uh, you know, certain kernel uh, function stubs, et cetera, for your specific kernel version that you're running, then you might have some work ahead of you. Um, currently, uh, flash, cache, flash cache is being maintained for uh, the RHEL uh, 5 and 6 kernels, and there is some community work uh, keeping it up to date on Debian, but still, it's out of tree kernel code. The same thing um, is true for uh, DRBD as far as that is concerned. DRBD is, of course, in the mainline kernel tree, but the mainline version or the, the, the DRBD code base that's currently in the mainline is equivalent to the 8.3.11 uh, DRBD release with a few patches on top. And um, this multiple volumes per resource is an 8.4 feature. And that is only currently available out of tree. Um, and I don't see that changing very soon because um, the, uh, uh, the block layer merge request for 3.3 just went out a few hours ago and there is no word of DOBD in there. So I would presume that the 8.4 stuff is not in the um, is not going into the 3.3 kernel. Um, disclosure at this point, um, I used to work for Linbit, which is the company behind um, the DRBD pro project and who, by the way, own all the trademarks in relation to that. Um, but I no longer am, and I have uh, no additional information as to um, what the mainlining effort is concerned other than what's available out on the web. So um, that's, just, that's also just my personal um, interpretation. Um, so, if you completely hate out-of-tree code, you may want to give this a second thought. Um, flash cache packaging is pretty much non-existent. Um, actually, um, even the build environment kind of sucks. Um, there's no support for Dester and other uh, stuff. So it's not really configurable. They, I understand anyone who wants to shy away from auto tools. That's fine, but um, like having, a, having build scripts that are completely unconfigurable, maybe not such a great idea. Um, and as a consequence, uh, there's also new RPM or Debian packaging. So um, I'm, that's something that I, um, I'm trying to get a discussion going on the flash cache dev list when I get back from LCA. Um, but that's another thing where if you're familiar with make file hacking and you're interested in this, Here's where you can help if you uh, know how to run a spec. Uh, if you know how to run a spec file, or you're familiar with uh, with Debian packaging, that's another thing where you can help. And the OCF resource agent, like I said, it's there. It works, but it could use some more testing. So if you're interested in that, then go ahead, try it out. If something breaks, let me know, and I'll work with you to fix it. So that means you can help. We want you to help. So if this is interesting to you, please do help. And finally, um, here's our company website and Twitter, blah, blah, blah. And I forgot to put in a slide with my own contact information. Sorry about that. It's very simple. I'm Florian at Hestexo.com. If um, anyone needs my card, I have plenty um, of them on me. And uh, finally, here's something you can do. If you like this talk, we have this thing on our website called the shout box. So if we help out people at conferences or on mailing lists or on IRC or whatnot, um, and you like that, then you can simply go to the shout box, use any of your uh, multitude of OpenID logins to log in, and leave a comment, and we always appreciate that. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I think I'm out of time, but we still have five minutes for questions, right? Um, we might be slightly over, actually, but um, if anybody's got a couple of questions, um, I will run up the back of the microphone. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just a quick question about yeah. flash cache. Um, it had a problem with the, its write back mode uh, with atomic writes, or the write back wasn't atomic, so you'd end up with torn pages when the system crashed. Uh, has that actually been fixed? I haven't seen anything go past, and if so, how are you avoiding that in your high availability uh, you know, systems? Um, I seem to recall a, a discussion on that, uh, but I'm, I 
don't remember the full context off the top of my head, um, can you find me later and we can take this offline? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Yep, I have a question about what since you run the cache on the host uh, and not on the disk array, uh, since you don't have knowledge about what spindles you're actually hitting with, with your I.O. and well, behind the disk array maybe you have a thousand SAS drives and 10,000 SATA drives, do you have any mechanisms to make sure that, that you only use the expensive cache to cache the hot spindles from, say, the, the expensive and hot, uh, hot disks and not wasting it on, on slow disks further down in the storage, storage subsystem? Um, so it's called flash cache because it's just a cache. What's the most, uh, what's the most used data is just what's being pulled out of this. So I'm not entirely sure where the question is headed, to be quite honest. Well, the question is if, if you have a 10 petabyte spread across, say, 20,000 disks, yeah. where, uh, where 1,000 disks are expensive uh, high-end disks, you would, in that case, want to make sure that you primarily use the very expensive cache to cache data only on, on the expensive spindles and not yes, waste and it, does, it on yes, the slow and it does exactly that. It's not, do not mistake it for, for uh, an HSM solution. It's not hierarchical storage management. It really is just a cache. Okay. And it will make sure that uh, whatever is cached or the stuff that needs to be cached, only that goes to the SSD. And what's on your backing storage is on your backing storage. That's it. We have, I think, can I take one more? Yeah, one more. Okay. There was one over here. Right here? Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on bcache, which is targeting mainline inclusion? Um, I don't have any specifics on that one, simply because I haven't had the chance to work on it. But um, I know it exists. And if there's something that goes, you know, that actually goes mainline, all for it. That's all. It's not, th this, this wasn't meant to, you know, indicate that this is the only thing that does it. Qu quite, quite the contrary. Yeah, but anything that's mainline, great, awesome. Okay, um, right, so yep. sorry for the overdraft. No, that's okay. um, and um, thanks, and uh, I'll be around. Please thank Florian. <laughs> <laughs>